One of the big insights of topology is the fact that a lot of the structures and notions and theorems that we've seen in the context of subspaces of Euclidean space hold just as well for a more general class of objects called topological spaces. Being permitted to pass to the realm of topological spaces allows us to do a variety of more interesting constructions, things that might not be subspaces of Euclidean space anymore, but are nevertheless worthy of our contemplation. Today we're going to talk about topological spaces and we're going to see a lot of examples. Let's get into it. The definition works according to a very helpful principle, which is that sometimes the conditions of a theorem can be turned into a definition that generalizes the notion that you've been treating up till now. For subspaces of Euclidean space, we were contemplating the notion of closeness of points to subsets, and we developed an operator that we called the closure operator, and that closure operator was seen to have three axioms. Now we're going to see that we can simply make that a definition. We're going to let x here be a set, and we're going to define a topology on x to be a map from the power set of x to itself. So this is a map that takes a subset of x to another subset of x. This will satisfy the same axioms that the closure operator for subspaces of Euclidean space satisfies. Here are those axioms. There are three of them. First, for every subset of x, that subset needs to be contained in tau of s. Remember, that was the, the case with subspaces of Euclidean space. Every subset is contained in its closure. Next, for every finite subset, sigma, of the power set, so that means a finite collection of subsets of x, when I form the union of those sets and close that up, that's equal to the union of the closures. In particular, if I take, for example, sigma to be the empty set, well, the empty set is certainly finite, then this is telling us that when I close up the empty set, I get the empty set again. Third and finally, for every subspace of x, the closure of the closure is equal to the closure. In other words, tau of tau of s is simply just tau of s. When you have a set x along with an operator tau satisfying these three conditions, this is called a topological space. We will sometimes be a little bit sloppy with our notation and refer to x itself as the topological space instead of writing x comma tau over and over again. Okay, so let's get to some examples straight away. Well, we've seen one really good network of examples by talking about Euclidean space. So let's consider Euclidean space Rn itself. And we'll consider the closure operator on subsets of Euclidean space. And remember, that's given by this formula, where I take the intersection, overall epsilon greater than zero, of the union, overall points of my S, of the ball of radius epsilon centered at S. This, we've already proved, is a topology. For our next example, suppose that we already have a topological space. For example, maybe we already have Rn. Suppose that we take a subset y of that set x. Then we can define a topology on y. So this is going to be an operation that carries a subset of y to a subset of y. And how will we do that? Well, we'll take the closure of the subset of y in x. Now, a priori, this might not be a subset of y anymore, so I'll have to intersect it with y. And once I do that, I then have a map from the power set of y to the power set of y. And the fact is that this is a topology on y. This is called the subspace topology. We'll again be quite casual in our speech and we'll simply say that y is a subspace of x. And when we say that, what we mean is that we're using the subspace topology. Now, in fact, we've already used this word subspace before to refer to subspaces of Euclidean space. And indeed, that terminology matches up with what we have here. If I take a subset of Euclidean space, 
then when I take the subspace corresponding to that subset, I'm using that closure operator defined on my y. That closure operator is exactly the topology given to us by the subspace topology. So the word subspace is not being used ambiguously here. It means the same thing in both the first part of this course and now. That's good news. There's more good news, which is that every set has at least one topology on it. Here's how. If I have any set X whatsoever, then I can take the identity map from the power set to the power set. I'll call this delta, and this is called the discrete topology on X. In this topology, there is no interesting notion of closeness. The only way for something to be close to a subset of my X in the discrete topology is for it to be contained in that subset. At the opposite extreme, there's a topology that we'll call chi, and what does it do? Well, if I'm trying to close up the empty set, the result will have to be the empty set. However, if I'm trying to take a subset of X that contains at least one point, then the closure will be everything. It will be all of X. Here, the notion of closeness is quite extreme. A point is close to a subset if and only if that subset is non-empty. This is called the chaotic or indiscrete topology on X. These are quite formal examples. Let's do an example that is a little less formal and rigid and a little more interesting to perhaps someone geometrically minded. Let's first define the set Rn plus as our old friend Euclidean space along with a new element called infinity and it really will have to be a new element. We're not going to assume that infinity is any element of Rn. So I'm going to take the union of these two things together. By the way, this blocky shaped union symbol is the symbol for disjoint union. Now we're going to endow this with a topology. In order to do that, I need to have a auxiliary notion, which is that of unboundedness. So if we have a subset of Rn plus, then we'll say that that subset is unbounded if either infinity is an element of S, so I have the new point in my S already, or for every real number capital N, there exists a point of S intersected with Rn whose distance from the origin is strictly greater than N. Now that we have that definition in hand, we can define a topology tau plus on Rn plus by the following rule. First, if S is not unbounded, that is to say, if there exists an N real number such that every single point S of S is within N of the origin, then the closure of my S is simply going to be the closure as taken inside Rn. Nothing very exciting happens there. On the other hand, if S is unbounded, then I'll take the closure of the part of S that lives in Euclidean space, and I'll tack on to that infinity. So this topology extends the usual topology on Rn, but in the case of unbounded sets, it adds on a point to the closure. This operation is relatively interesting, the addition of this extra point. Let's see what it looks like in a couple of simple examples. Let's begin by thinking about the line R1, and I'm adding on this point at infinity. And how does that work? Well, it says that if I have a set like this, for example, that's unbounded in each direction, or even just in one direction, I don't need it to be unbounded in both directions. So if it's just unbounded in even just one direction, then this set is going to be close to infinity. So if you reflect on what happens here, you'll see that the line gets wrapped around like this, and it becomes close to this point at infinity. What am I saying? I'm saying that R plus, this is a picture of R plus, actually ends up to be homeomorphic 
to the circle S1. In the same vein, if I take the plane, this is R2, and I tack on this point at infinity, and I arrange it so that every subset that is unbounded, so if I'm allowed to go off to infinity in any direction here, then that subset will be close to my point at infinity. So in effect, this point at infinity gathers up the rest of R2 around it, and we have the sphere. Now my ability to draw this picture are starting to become more and more limited, but I want you to imagine a cube, which is our picture of R3, and you can tack on a point at infinity now, and I claim that will be homeomorphic to S3. In an earlier lecture, I stated that we would have a topological way to contemplate the three sphere, and this is that way to contemplate it. You can imagine the room that you're sitting in with its four walls and its ceiling and its floor, and you can imagine being able to stand there and throw pebbles toward the wall. When you do, if you were living in S3, the pebbles would come back from the other direction and hit you in the head. Similarly, if you threw the pebble down, that pebble would come from the ceiling and hit you in the head. This is a general phenomenon. There's a homeomorphism between the n-sphere and Rn+. Plus. In other words, the n-sphere is what you get by taking ordinary Euclidean space and adding just one more point. But the way in which you add that point has to be in the following way, it has to be the case that that point is close to unbounded subsets of your Euclidean space. Good. More examples. Here's a particularly interesting example. Let's consider the set of lines by which we mean lines through the origin that is to say, one-dimensional vector subspaces of the plane R2. We're going to give this a topology, and how are we going to do it? Well, if I have such a line, then I can write down its slope. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that if I happen to have a line spanned by a vector, x, y, a non-zero vector, x, y, then I have two options. The slope might be y over x, that's if x is non-zero. Or it might be the case that the line is vertical, i.e. x is zero, and so my slope is infinite. This is now defining for us a map, mu, from p1 to r plus, which we just defined. Let's use this map to define a topology. We'll declare that for every subset s of p1, its closure is going to be the set of those lines whose slope is close to the image of s under the slope function inside r plus, using the topology that we've just seen. It turns out that since tau plus is a topology on r plus, this also defines a topology on this set of lines, and so we have a topological space, and that topological space is called the real projective space of dimension one. This is also known as the real projective line. Notice that the way this space was created is really completely independent of its life inside any Euclidean space. We constructed this space as an abstract topological space. We can speak about open and closed subsets of general topological spaces. So let's let X be a topological space, then a subset Z of X is said to be closed if and only if it's equal to its own closure just as in the case with subspaces of Euclidean space. And just as with subspaces of Euclidean space, complementarily, a subset U is said to be open if and only if its complement is closed. Let's see this notion in action with yet another example. This is quite an abstract example of a topological space. 
let's let P be a pre-order. That is, P here will be a set, and less than or equal will be some relation on that set, such that the following two conditions hold. First, for every point of that set, x is less than or equal to x. Second, we have transitivity. For every triple of elements, x, y, and z in P, if x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to z, then x is less than or equal to z. These two conditions are the only two conditions you need in order to be a pre-order. If in addition you require that if x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x, then x equals y, then we call this pre-order a partially ordered set or poset. Nevertheless, if we just have a pre-order, that's sufficient for us to construct a topology on our set P. Here's how that topology is defined. For every subset, S of P, we'll define the closure to consist of those points of P for which there exists an element of S that is greater than or equal to our X. When we take a subset S of P, when we close it, that is to say when we form its closure, we're going to add in all of those points that are less than some point of our S. This again is a topology, it's called the Alexandrov topology on P. This topology, even though it's quite formal, plays a very big role in the study of stratified topological spaces. Let's look at this story in action. Let's consider the following pre-order. I'm just going to take the numbers 0 through n, and I'm going to order them in the usual way. So let's write down the closure of various subsets of brackets n. Suppose that I just begin here with just the element 0 by itself. What is its closure? Its closure is itself. It already is closed. The same is not true, however, if I try to take the closure of the number 1. If I try to take the closure of the number 1, it's no longer closed. Instead, I get 0 and 1 together. The closure of 2 includes 0 and 1. The closure of 3 includes 0, 1, and 2. And this trend continues. In the final stage, when I just consider the closure of the single element n, I get the entire set. This single point here is open inside this topological space. Here's another example. Let's consider a poset consisting of A, B, and C where B is greater than or equal to each of A and C. So when I close up A, I just get A again. A is already closed. C is already closed as well. But when I close the singleton consisting of B, I end up with this whole heart shape. Here now is a fact specifying a topology, tau on a set X, is really the same thing as providing the collection, C, say, of closed subsets, and that collection will be stable under intersections and finite unions. By forming the complements of these sets, we see this is the same as specifying the collection O of open subsets, which will need to be stable now under finite intersections and all unions. 
In most textbooks, the way you see a topology defined is as a collection of subsets that are stable under finite intersections and arbitrary unions. Let's see that these three pieces of information, the data of a topology, the data of its collection of closed subsets, and the data of its collection of open subsets, can be exchanged with one another. Giving any one is equivalent to giving the two others. First, we can see that the collection of closed subsets can be written in terms of tau. Indeed, it's the collection of subsets z such that tau of z equals z. The open subsets can be written in terms of c. They're exactly the complements of the closed subsets. The closure operator can be written in terms of z. It can be the intersection over all those closed subsets that contain my s. Or it can be written in terms of the open subsets as the intersection of the complements of those open subsets that do not intersect my s. Consequently, any one of these can be written in terms of any one of the others. So these three pieces of data are all equivalent. Pardon me while I have a strange interlude. Now we should talk about continuity of maps between topological spaces. Let's have a proposition that will seem all too familiar. Let's begin with two topological spaces, X and Y. Then the following are equivalent for a map F from X to Y. First, that for every subset S of X, the image of the closure is contained in the closure of the image. That is to say, if you have a point that is close to S and you push it into Y using F, then that point will have to be close to the image of S under F. Dually, for every subset of Y, T, the inverse image of the closure of T contains the closure of the inverse image of T. Notice that when we pass to the inverse image, the direction of the containment changed. Next is the old standby for every closed subset of Y, its inverse image in X is closed. And by forming complements, the inverse images of open sets are also open. Each of these is equivalent to the others. The proof is very much the same as in the case of subspaces of Euclidean space. But you'll notice that there's something different from the context of subspaces of Euclidean space, which is that I no longer have access to an epsilon delta characterization of continuity. If we have a map between two topological spaces, call it F, and if it satisfies any and therefore all of these conditions, then we will say that that map is continuous. Another notion, which is just the same as in the context of subspaces of Euclidean space, is the concept of homeomorphism. If F is a continuous bijection, whose inverse is also continuous, in that case, we say that F is a homeomorphism. And we say that X and Y are homeomorphic, or equivalently topologically isomorphic. As always, let's look at some examples. I always liked this example because I was told as a child that 1 over 0 isn't defined. And now I'm going to define it. So let's define a map f from r plus to r plus. Remember this is our new topological space which we obtained by taking r and adding a point at infinity. And secretly, this is actually just a circle. Here's the map that I want to write down. Well, as long as my x is a real number different from zero, then I'll simply take one over x. But if x is equal to zero, then I'm gonna give 
1 over x a new identity, I'm going to call it infinity. And of course, if I happen to take my infinity here, and I take 1 over infinity, I want to get 0. This is now perfectly well defined as a map from r plus to r plus, and I want to claim that this map is in fact continuous. This is the most natural extension of the function 1 over x to this new domain r plus. But how do we prove that such a function is continuous? Well, for this it's quite handy that in fact continuity is a local notion. That is to say, what you'd like to argue is that continuity is basically fine here, and that the only places where we really have to check by hand any continuity are at these two places here. And that's exactly what we're going to do. If you have two topological spaces, x and y, and you have a map between them and a point x of x, then we'll say that f is continuous at little x if and only if for every subset such that x is close to that subset, f of x must be close to the image f of s. This is continuity at a point, and now f here is going to be just continuous if and only if it's continuous at every single point. But now this little addition of the word at actually gives me a little bit of power. It allows me to break up my problem into something that I'm checking for each point. And if, as in, in this example, I already know something non-trivial about continuity at a lot of points, here I'm going to take all the points of my space except for these two, then I can cut out a big chunk of my problem and break it down to this problem of trying to understand continuity at these two points. Let's see that in action. So here's our map again. We've broken it up into these three pieces. And the good news is that for these guys here in R minus zero, we already know that F is continuous at those points. That's a standard fact of analysis. So it remains for us to prove that f is now continuous at both zero and infinity. But now let's unpack our definition. Being continuous at zero precisely means that if I have a subset to which zero is close, then the image set will have to be close to infinity. But that exactly means that the image set will have to be unbounded. Conversely, if I take a subset that's close to infinity, then that set will have to be unbounded. When I take its image under f, I'll want 0 to be close to that image. In other words, we're looking at the sentence that a subset s of r is close to 0 if and only if its image under this map f is unbounded. Now that, of course, is just true. If a subset is close to zero, then certainly f of that subset is going to be an unbounded set. And vice versa, if f of s is an unbounded set for some subset of r, then it must be that, that subset gets arbitrarily close to zero. Now notice that one of the things that's sort of playing in the background here is the fact that f is its own inverse. Since it's its own inverse, and since that inverse is continuous, this is a homeomorphism. Good, so at long last we've defined 1 over 0, and it turned out to be infinity, just as we all wanted in grade school. Here's another continuous map. Let's look at the projective line again. That was P1R. The topology, remember, was defined by using this slope map. This is the map that carries a line to its slope, where I allow the slope of a vertical line to appear, and that just becomes infinity. We use this map to define the topology. We said that a point and a subset were close here if and only if 
their images were close here. So that means that this map is actually continuous by definition. There's no funny business here. We built this space so that this map would be continuous. There's a sneaky surprise waiting for us here, which is in fact that this map is in fact a homeomorphism. So the projective line and R plus and S1 are all homeomorphic topological spaces. Here's another example of a more abstract variety. Suppose that I have two topologies, tau1 and tau2, on the same underlying set X. So I have two topological spaces with the same underlying set. We'll say that tau1 is finer than tau2, and that tau2 is coarser than tau1, if and only if the identity map from x to itself is continuous when regarded as a map from x with tau1 as the topology to x with tau2 as the topology. If we take any set whatsoever, x, and any topological space whatsoever, then any old map, f from x to y, is continuous when you regard x as equipped with the discrete topology. Remember, in the discrete topology, the notion of closeness is trivial. You can never be close to a subset unless you're inside that subset. So this map is automatically continuous when we consider x with its discrete topology. Dually, if we consider x with the chaotic or indiscrete topology, chi, then every map from y to x will be continuous. In particular, the discrete topology delta is the finest topology on x. This is the most exclusive topology there is. If you wish to become close to a subset, you have to actually be contained in that subset. This is what we mean by fine topologies. On the other hand, the chaotic topology, chi, is the coarsest possible topology. If you want to be close to a non-empty subset in the chaotic topology, all you have to do is be there. And if you're there, then you're automatically close to a non-empty subset in the indiscrete or chaotic topology. So this gives us two extremes in the world of topologies on our set X. We have a finest delta and we have a coarsest chi. And every other topology on X will have to sit between these two. In other words, it will have to be coarser than the discrete topology, and it will have to be finer than the chaotic topology. Let's look at one final example. Let's consider that poset N of integers between 0 and N with their usual ordering. And let's once again consider the Alexandrov topology for that poset structure. If I write down a continuous map from a random topological space into my n, what have I done? Well, at the very least, what I've done is I've specified a collection of closed subsets. What are those closed subsets? Well, if I take the first k plus 1 elements of my poset n, that will be a closed subset in the Alexandrov topology. Therefore, when I take its inverse image, I get a closed subset of my x. I get one of these closed subsets for each k in my n. So I get z0, and I get z1, and z1 contains z0, because after all, 0, 1 contains 0. Similarly, z2 contains z1, and so I end up with this sequence of closed subsets, and the last of these closed subsets is the inverse image of all of brackets n, zn, and so that must be x. Since this map is continuous, all of these subsets 
are closed. And in fact, this map determines and is determined by this sequence of subsets. And this is a finite filtration of closed subsets of my X. Indeed, I say that this map F determines and is determined by this filtration. If I have the map F, then I can certainly construct the filtration. We've already seen that. But if I have the filtration, then I can construct the map F, and the map is defined as follows. I'll simply take the minimum K, such that X is contained in ZK, and that'll define F of X.